Bear, bear with us as we're dealing with some technology. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this evening's New River Valley Passenger Rail Station Feasibility Study Public Meeting. As you can note on the screen, um, we're going to have some variety of ways for you to participate in this evening's presentation. We are uh, recording this meeting, and this recording will be available to you um, on the project website. And we will be having a live Q&A at the end of the meeting. So uh, you'll notice in the chat, you are able to engage directly with the host. I will be able to see your questions and comments come through and filter those for the team. And I'll be able to um, relay those to the project team at the end of this evening's presentation. All the comments are being um, provided as a post-meeting summary to you all at the end, and then we will be uh, collecting these comments for public record. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the slides, so I'm just kind of hoping I covered all those bases, um, but if, if that's all good to go, again, please use the chat uh, on your screen to be able to connect with the team. Um, you will be muted and your videos turned off just to help with these technology lags that we are, you know, always experiencing, it seems. Um, but if, if that's the case, we will be transitioning to Michael McLaughlin, who will discuss the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority. Um, and before Michael starts, it does look like the, the public is still only seeing the first slide, um, the first full computer screen slide as well. So uh, Colin, I don't know if you wanna stop sharing and resharing, it looks like the public's having that same issue. <clears throat> All right, we are seeing some movement. If you just hit slideshow, Right. Yeah, it does look like there's a little bit of a lag right there. So the public can see the second slide right now. It does look like we're still kind of hanging out in the, the lack of slideshow. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for, for your patience. On it, if you want to go ahead uh, that way, that might be a little bit easier for Michael and Kate to kind of navigate through the slides. Um, we are obviously seeing a little bit of lag, but we are currently on slide three. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for uh, bearing with us on our screens. It, like Amanda said, there's, we are there about a good 15 seconds or so before, uh, if not more, before the rest of the folks can see it. Um, so the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, I want to give a little background on, the, on what we call VPRA. We were created by the 2020 General Assembly. Um, we were given, I'm not going to read every, every word on the screen, but we were given the powers uh, necessary to carry out various duties, uh, first and foremost to design, build, and maintain rail facilities. Um, this is coming on the heels of um, an agreement we had laid out with CSX in December of 2019. Um, where we were, were purchasing rail property and agreeing to build um, 30 plus miles of rail track in the next 10 years um, and owning um, quite a few hundred miles of rail track and corridor in Virginia. Um, hence why the power is given to us by the General Assembly. Um, we will not be operating rail service though. That will be left up to rail operators such as Amtrak and VRE, and of course the freight operators such as CSX and Norfolk Southern and the shoreline railroads will continue to operate freight service. We, I mentioned earlier, uh, we are here on behalf of our executive director, DJ Stadler, and our 15 member board. Um, so that, that 12 members who are voting members and three members um, who are ex officio, uh, DRPT, v, VRE, and Amtrak. And the picture on the right hand slide um, is a picture of Long Bridge, and that is in Washington, D.C., between Washington, D.C. and Arlington. And if you're wondering what that has to do with anything in the New River Valley, that is the biggest bottleneck on the East Coast, and hence by having an agreement with CSX to expand Long Bridge, double the capacity, that opened the door for us to negotiate with Norfolk Southern, which I'll get into here in a few minutes. So next slide, please. Oh, looks like the lag has been reduced, which is good. Um, as I mentioned, back in December of 2019, we had an agreement with not just CSX, but also Amtrak and VRE, um, almost $4 billion worth of acquisition and uh, infrastructure that will be built um, in Virginia to be able to uh, separate freight and passenger service and also increase uh, 
double V double Amtrak service and increased V re service in the Fredericksburg line by more than by 75% plus introducing nighttime and weekend service as well. Um, and we finished the agreements with CSX, VRE, uh, and Amtrak uh, in, in the end of March uh, with a signing ceremony that was attended by the USDOT sec secretary. Um, and then on the heels of that, uh, during that time, we've been working with Norfolk Southern uh, to expand uh, passenger rail to New River Valley and to add a second Roanoke train. And that was announced back in May and in the Christiansburg at the Christiansburg Mall. And in, in January, just uh, what's still last month, we did finish the definitive agreements with Norfolk Southern. However, financial close will come in mid-22 after we uh, complete some uh, regulatory uh, procedures with the Service Transportation Board and I'll do other due diligence with Norfolk Southern. As you can see from the map, uh, by being able to expand uh, the second train of the Roanoke line and to the New River Valley, we are making this, this, the, the map in Virginia uh, serve that many more people in Virginia um, and actually on into the Northeast as our service, Amtrak service does go on well past DC to New York and Boston. Next slide. A little bit of background on what we call the Roanoke route, started the, as the Lynchburg route. Uh, we more than tripled the ridership that was forecasted for that first year in 20, 2009 and 2010, as you can see from the numbers on the screen. And in fact, by 2019, the route carried over 220,000 passengers. Um, and, as, and as I mentioned, um, in the spring and, the, and the, with the completion of the definitive agreements, Norfolk Southern will allow a second Roanoke train and an extension to River Valley of both the first and second train once certain infrastructure projects are, are complete. Along, as part of the deal, we, Virginia is purchasing 28 miles of what we call the Virginia Line from Norfolk Southern, which is a, a line a little bit parallel, a little bit to the north of the main Norfolk Southern Line uh, that runs a little closer to I-81. Next slide. And for those who are waiting to be admitted, we'll meet you here in a second. Uh, a little more background. Uh, the, the deal with Norfolk Southern includes over $200 million worth of infrastructure. And the infrastructure is, is actually going to be built from as far north as, as Manassas. Um, we're adding double track there to create a long double track segment uh, between Manassas and just 10 miles north of Culpeper. Um, also, the other infrastructure projects are uh, in the West Roanoke Yard, so just the west of the Roanoke platform. And also, we'll be making improvements on that Virginia line I mentioned, on the 20 miles of Virginia line, and of course, the main reason we're here improvements uh, that will be, be able to facilitate a passenger station in the, in the New River Valley. I should also note that some ridership studies has estimated 80,000 net new rides along the whole corridor after we extend the second train to New River Valley. So that's not just riders in New River Valley. That's the net new riders from um, New River Valley to points north. Next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Kate. Thanks, Michael. Um... The next slide is regarding um, the study area itself. So um, the way to read this slide is to look at the left side first, um, which is the study area that the feasibility study uh, examined as part of the work here. Um, what we did was we reflected on um, studies that occurred in the region um, that over the last decade to determine where it would be potentially feasible for a station to go. There had been a lot of good work already uh, that already occurred in the region regarding um, recommendations for, for a station area. And so we, we focused on those studies and then narrowed it down to the area circled on the left side of the screen. On the right, right side of the screen, we wanted to examine um, the railroad, the existing rail lines that were within that circle. So the way to look at this slide is to look at the bottom side first. So on the bottom side, you see the red line, <clears throat> and it's labeled NNW, or Norfolk Southern um, Railway Christiansburg D District. We also call that the Norfolk Southern Main Line. Um, and I'll be calling it probably the Norfolk Southern Main Line as we occur progress this conversation. Um, the second line on the screen to look at is in the, the very small dots that sort of run um, north and south on the page or up and down on the page, and that's the Blacksburg branch terminating near the Corning site 
um, over by the for Business 460. Um, and the third line on the screen is green on the upper part of the page, and that's called Norfolk Southern Whitethorn District. Um, or the v former Virginia line. And for purposes of this um, conversation, I'll be calling it the Virginia line. And that represents the best opportunity for Virginia to move forward with a rail station location. So next slide, Colin. When we looked at, we narrowed down five uh, station areas for potential um, locations. It was apparent because of the um, uh, agreements that we struck with Norfolk Southern that our best opportunity was on the Virginia line or the, the line on the upper side of the state of the screen and we'll talk about that in a second but that essentially when he, we did our first screening criteria eliminated the North Franklin um, East site from consideration because we were not able to operate passenger service on that um, NS um, main line that I described on the bottom of the page that left for um, station study areas for us to focus um, information and, and determine feasibility based on impacts. Next slide. So we wanted to take a moment to talk to you about the project timeline. And this um, timeline describes where the, we are in the entirety of the process for the station construction. So if you think about this slide, um, you'll see the we, we are here line. Um, and we're almost completed with the feasibility study stage, and we'll talk more about what that entails in the next slide. But um, you'll see from that stage, we go into the next um, phase of the project, which is the National Environment, Environmental Policy Act um, or the Federal Environmental Action. That's complemented by additional engineering that we will have to do. Um, after we do the NEPA work, or while we do the NEPA work, we'll continue to refine that engineering and move it towards construction by 2026. Next slide. <clears throat> the next slide describes where um, we are with the, fe the feasibility study itself. And um, in a moment, you'll see that the um, study has been ongoing since fall of uh, earlier this fall when we began um, working on the research approach and um, identifying impact of stations um, as you'll see in the following slides. Uh, we also concurrently started to develop what was known as a NEPA class of action and that's really how the federal government determines what type of environmental study we'll do. Um, so that is ongoing work. And we started a public outreach, and that's been going on um, it, with some intensity starting at the end of January when we sent out, actually in December, certified mailings to all property owners within those study areas that you saw previous, on the previous slide, um, the four that we mentioned, not the North Franklin East. And we've been meeting with property owners and key stakeholder focus groups uh, since then up until last Friday. Um, and, and next steps for us is we're at the public meeting today and we'll continue a public outreach tomorrow, which we'll talk about in a moment, and um, go on to file a NEPA class of action with FRA. Next slide. So what is NEPA? Those of you who aren't familiar with the NEPA uh, or the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, um, may be familiar with this picture here. We think of uh, NEPA as an umbrella, and it, what it does is it really sets up um, projects like ours, transportation projects, for analyzing their impacts based on the, the host of acts and policies that are listed underneath that umbrella. And you'll see that, that those policies and acts span from anything from hazmat um, hazardous materials investigation of, of what impacts you might be doing to that type of um, element of the um, a policy or act to things like the uh, historic properties that surround the, the site and, and gives it an intensive look based on um, a purpose and need. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide. So in terms of the objective of our, of our study, we looked at this in, three, in a three-step approach. 
the first thing I described a few slides ago, which was to develop the um, potential for station locations based on um, what, was, what was feasible for an area. The next step from that was to de develop a purpose of need statement to complete a screening analysis and the elements of the screening analysis that was based on that purpose and need. And then the third step um, is to, to work to a NEPA class of action to file that with the Federal Railway Administration. Next slide. The next slide is regarding the purpose and need. And I won't read all of these to you, but essentially we, what we did is our approach was to look at the existing studies that had occurred in the last decade. Um, and basically, there was three elements, primary elements of those, the purpose and need that we identified. One was economic development for the region. You can see how that's both a purpose and need on this slide, as well as a multimodal demand. There was both ridership demand and then the demand to move around the region and the state without a car. Um, we, re we listened to those um, demands and needs, and we were able to develop the purpose and need statement from that in these three ways, or, uh, six ways. So this is the way that we analyzed each station location. And the way to read the slide is from left to right. So the purpose and need elements that you saw on the previous slide are listed on the, on the column on the left. Um, so we listed each, each of the purpose and need elements and then balanced them against certain criteria. So you'll see in column number one, the railroad operations are listed, and you'll see what purpose and need elements that those railroad needs list. You'll, you'll note operations here, and this is where the North Franklin East site was eliminated due to the inability for Virginia to operate passenger rail on the NS North um, main line. Um, the second criteria that you'll see labeled as number two is environmental station study area. So we looked at the big study area and we tried to balance the purpose and needs in the, the elements that you see underneath that column. Um, when we, we looked and examined the, the impact that those uh, criteria created for each station, they were about the same. And then um, we took it further through a third screening stage, which you see is much more intensive and had more um, elements to analyze. And you'll see in the next slide um, the way that the, the um, results came out. So um, as I described in the slide before, um, all five uh, station study areas were taken um, through that first railroad operations uh, screening, resulting in four remaining. Um, when we took through the second screening, four also remained, and then it was a third, third screening criteria that uh, the North um, the New River Valley Mall North and West stations were um, uh, contained for uh, further development in consideration as part of a NEPA class of action. Next slide. So Wayne Hyatt will jump in here and tell you a little bit about how we looked at each station itself. Wayne? Thank you, Kate. In order to go from the study areas that you've seen down to the actual impact areas of a potential station location, we had, to, we had to determine the best process for doing that. And it's based on the forecast ridership for the future, which, which as you see here is, is up to 87,000 annual passengers. The Amtrak Great American Stations Planning Development Guidelines state that that kind of a station should be a caretaker. And as you see on this slide in the upper left-hand corner, that's an example of a caretaker station in California with associated community amenities attached to either side of it. The key aspects of the station, of a caretaker station, is that it'll, it'll accommodate up to 100,000 annual passengers, and it's about 3,500 square feet in size. So it's not a large building, but it, it will handle that many passengers in a year. The FRA guidelines require a high-level platform. Uh, for new stations. However, the freight railroads, due to safety concerns for both their equipment and, and freight, as well as for passengers, require that a four-foot uh, high-level platform be on a track away from freight operations. So you'll see in the upper right-hand corner a picture of what a, a, an example high-level platform looks like. It's four feet above the top of rail 
And in this operation, that would be a separate track for passenger trains only. Now the, the station itself is, is sized conservatively in order to create the poten largest potential footprint for the future uh, NEPA clearance that'll be required to build it. So what you are about to see is a, a, a largest possible footprint for the building, the transit circulation and, and uh, drop-off areas, the, the vehicle circulation and drop-off areas, the parking areas, and a future community space that, that uh, would potentially provide opportunities for other um, station and related services uh, at the station itself. So with that, Kate, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks Wayne. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk to you, walk everyone through um, the individual station um, designs that we developed to, de to examine impacts as we discussed earlier in the slideshow. <clears throat> this first uh, slide examines what's known as the New River Valley Mall West site. And it really takes a look at, at, at the layout that would be on the New River Valley Mall West study area. Um, so the way to read this slide is to first look at the lower side of the screen where it shows the screening criteria. So you see that this moved through each element of the three screening criteria uh, and was the least impactful on the site that you're examining now. Um, in terms of the elements of the station, um, first I'll look at the parking lot. So this park, I'll say this is a high level concept. So the station site in the future will likely not look anything like this. It was purely to identify major impacts um, that a station would cause on a location in order to determine whether or not that station site was feasible. So the parking lot configuration in orange will likely not be the parking lot configuration that's moved forward. Um, but it was for this analysis important to have a conservative approach for that, that parking lot size. So you'll see that is in, within the existing station um, parking lot that is existed on the mall. The other element to look at is the transit drop off and the kiss and ride so that folks that are taking buses to the station are able to easily access the station through some sawtooth bus bays. And the kiss and ride is will enable um, car share folks or people taking taxis or getting dropped off to easily access um, the site as well. Additionally, you'll see in the um, yellow is the relocation of the Huckleberry Trail. So we recognize that this is on the Huckleberry Trail, um, but we would relocate it as part of our design work. There's another element to recognize, which is that the parking lot itself is higher than where the station would be. So what would happen is that there would be a bridge that would access um, a stair or an elevator to go down to the station location itself and then access what's in um, turquoise, which is the station, and about a, a 10,000 square foot um, potential community space, which is to be determined we did a conservative approach for that space. So it's a, a much wider um, location than likely would be constructed should it be constructed. Um, that building would have direct access um, from the station to the platform. And the platform is in the green. Because of the requirement to get remove passenger service from the main line that the freight would travel on, the, the pocket track that would access the station as Wayne described is in orange. So that is the, the location of the track there. Um, other elements to note here is to serve multimodal purpose, we proposed um, a pedestrian or bike um, bridge that would give direct access from the either, other side of the tracks to the station itself or to the mall. Next slide. Um, this second slide is to describe the site plan for the New River Valley North site. Um, with the same color scheme in mind, um, we looked at the location just north of the mall, uh, directly adjacent to the, the parking lot. So the parking itself would be accessed through the um, New River Road um, on the mall. 
And um, the, you can see that the parking lot's there in orange, uh, which, which is directly behind the station, the transit service, and then the relocated um, Huckleberry Trails behind that in the yellow. There, you would have to cross the actual road to the parking lot um, with the Huckleberry Trails to be able to access um, the rest of the Huckleberry Trail um, down to the south or um, west of the site. The station and uh, platform and the pedestrian bridge are retained in this concept, so you would st still retain the, the ability to cross the tracks uh, without a car um, to the neighborhood on the other side of the track. Um, and the community space is retained as well. Um, so you'll see also a, a stream that runs um, through the site, but uh, it is it has um, infrastructure to cross it for the road or for the track or platform. But this is a zoomed out version of that same New River Valley North site. And we included this to illustrate how we would access the Virginia line, which is to the north of the site. So you'll see in the orange on the right side of the page, a, connect, a new connection track to the Virginia line to the Blacksburg branch, one that does not um, exist today. And that is to um, have easy access from the Virginia line to the New River Valley Mall sites, whether it be this New River Valley North site or it would be the New River Valley West site. That connection would remain. You'd al you also can note the relationship to the spur track that serves Corning here. And you'll see that on the bottom side of the screen. We just wanted to show this so you had a better relationship of where um, the elements around these sites and the track is. Next slide. So again, all this is concept, is conceptual, but it does. This gives you another view of what that connection um, track is. So the the track here is a, again in orange. Um, the Virginia line is to the north of the screen, and you'll see um, the uh, the relationship to the the mall sites on the the bottom of the screen in the in the um, Blacksburg branch in a relationship that doesn't exist today. Um, we thought this was important to show because we will have an impact on Huckleberry Trail, but it will be a temporary impact and there would be a permanent solution for the Huckleberry Trail in the future to cross the track. It will likely be an elevated um, crossing of the track similar to how Huckleberry Trail crosses over the Virginia line today through a bridge or some something to, similar. Next slide. This second, um, this Ellet slide is to show the relationship of the uh, impacts of what we examined for the Ellet station concept design. So what we looked at here was how the pocket track and the station and, and the multimodal elements that we knew um, was a purpose and needed uh, element of this station would be in the relationship of the existing property owners and the existing condition. So you'll see here um, a new road connection and a multimodal trail connection to Janelle Road that does not exist today. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the road improvement that is required to serve that element, Ellet Road. So that's in, highlighted in the yellow or the lighter line color. So keep in mind, anytime we had a station that we needed to um, construct, we needed to to determine the impact of not just that station, but any infrastructure that would serve that station. For example, on this, this um, Ellet station, we would have to improve uh, many miles of road with both a um, multimodal trail and uh, widen the road to be able to properly serve buses along that um, uh, road connection. So there would be intersection improvements, trail improvements, and the like meaning that the impact of that Ellet station was not just centralized to that Ellet, those few Ellet properties that you saw, but also to the road improvements that there would be a direct impact on adjacent properties. Next slide. This next slide um, illustrates the concept design for the Miramax station. And you'll note that this does look different than the other station concepts that were developed. Um, and what's notable about this is the topography and the challenging um, stream and floodplain that, that is here. So the parking lot is in a different location. That's mainly because of the topography. It couldn't be um, located directly behind the station as you could see in the other 
station uh, designed. Um, to to address the topography, we had to go higher than, than where the station was. And once you look at where the station, the platform, the pocket tracks, and the elements of the transit and um, kiss and ride drop off are, you'll note that there are streams. Those are in the light blue lines. And, and that it indicates that there is actually a floodplain um, concern in this area, making it not a good candidate um, to move forward. Next slide. Again, this uh, Miramax um, station, we consulted with uh, VDOT uh, regarding the recommendations for what road and how to access those um, stations, how that would work. And they recommended that an improvement be, be made from 460 to the Virginia Drive, um, and then a new road would serve the Miramax station. So what you're seeing here in the light green is that um, road connection, and you can see it goes through um, uh, non-developed um, greenfield sites here. So it's pretty impactful as compared to the New River Valley um, small areas, which um, are access existing roads and transit that serve those roads um, and the mall uh, and have much smaller impact. Next slide. So when we looked at these stations, we also, as part of our work, we examined the costs. And so we they were not the determining factor of what stations went forward, but we wanted to have a sense of how much these road improvements or infrastructure improvements in the case of track um, would cost as compared to the station work itself. So you can see um, the different elements of the cost outlined here in the column. So there's a column that shows station system costs. That's only the station, the platforms, the parking lot, the element, the station building, the um, tra pocket track, that's the elements of the station that are listed in that column. The middle column that shows the off-site infrastructure is those uh, track improvements, the road improvements, and that's the elements of those um, that column that we were able to do a high-level cost estimate on. Finally, the totals in the rightmost column, and you can see that the New River Valley Mall sites are about equivalent in terms of cost. Next slide. Uh, and I'm going to throw it over to Amanda to discuss um, the outreach so far. Amanda? Great. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, so in addition to the website, which is probably where you found the link uh, for this meeting, we conducted several email and social media campaigns to advertise about this project. Um, as part of the initial outreach, we conducted our first survey and we had a great turnout. It only took about five minutes for people to complete and it asked a range of questions. Um, but as you can see on the screen, we had, you know, over 2,600 survey participants, which um, was very helpful to see, you know, the public's opinion and comments on all of these types of concerns that we're dealing with. And there was great alignment between what the feasibility study was showcasing as well as what the public's concerns were. Uh, in addition to the survey, which launched on December 22nd until January 31st, we conducted property owner meetings for the first two months of this year, as well as key stakeholder focus group meetings um, in February. The public meeting that we're having today, we are providing the same public meeting opportunity tomorrow at noon. So in the event that someone you know may be interested, they can um, watch the recording, or they can even participate in tomorrow's meeting. On the next slide, we're going to talk about the upcoming Survey 2, which is another opportunity for you to provide your feedback in advance of, of this meeting. I will also take that survey link and post it into the chat in the event that you are watching this on your phone and you don't have the ability to hover uh, your camera over there. But it will launch this evening and is open until March 15th. So again, another quick survey for you to provide feedback on what you are witnessing tonight as part of um, part of this public meeting. I'm going to transition back to Kate, who will discuss next steps, and then from there we will get into uh, the live Q&A. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so the next steps for our survey is to complete the survey itself. Um, we are still um, writing the narrative uh, regarding the survey, uh, and we'll post it on the website in the spring when we conclude our, our work. Um, we'll release Survey 2 and close it by March 14th. So if you're interested, please um, either access the survey via our website or the QR code. Um, and then we will file, complete and file the NEPA class of action with the Federal Railway Administration. 
and we'll begin work on the NEPA study once that um, that federal environmental action is agreed to by the federal government. Uh, we'll continue to meet with stakeholders and um, and we look forward to talking to you guys all again in the future. Next slide. So Amanda, um, I think you can describe what the Q&A will be like. Sure, sure. So as everyone's probably aware, uh, you are both muted and your videos turned off. And as you know, again, we apologize for technology lag. So we highly encourage you to use the chat feature. Um, and this will be your opportunity to ask Kate and the rest of the VPRA team any questions you have. Um, again, the chat will be open for about half an hour unless you know we run out of questions. We'll obviously end the evening early. But um, any questions that are not addressed during this meeting will be collected and addressed as part of that public meeting summary that we discussed at the beginning of tonight's call. And we will provide this meeting summary uh, in March um, once we kind of gather all the, all the comments, especially including survey two, and we will make this available to you all on the project website. So having said that, uh, Kate, if you are ready, we do have some questions coming through the chat. And I will go ahead and get those started for you. So I, um, for the sake of, of comments and questions fielding, I've reorganized them um, for, for VPRA to understand. Um, it's gonna be based off themes. So we're gonna kind of go through themes and then if other questions come through the chat, then we'll get those addressed. Um, but Kate, the first theme is in regards to operations. Uh, Michael had asked, would Northbrook Southern still use this rail section from Christiansburg to Salem for freight operations? Uh, yes, Amanda, I can answer that. Yes, Norfolk Southern will continue to use the Virginia line, as this gentleman mentioned, from Salem to Christiansburg for freight operations. Um, there will be freight and passenger trains on that segment. Okay. I should note, I sh I should note that with all of our rail deals, as I mentioned very early on, the, the freight rails will still be the um, operators for freight rail on, on these segments, and they will be the operator as deemed by the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, the next question, again, that came through for operations um, from William. Uh, may I suggest giving these passenger operations to private companies such as Brightline in Florida? Companies like these can receive more funding from private funders and can therefore increase levels of quality. Yes, I'm familiar with Brightline. In fact, wrote it uh, recently myself. However, we have some agreements with Amtrak, where they're contributing funds to projects such as Longbridge, where, where we are in a partnership with them. They have contributed $944 million, Amtrak has, to the, the projects in Northern Virginia that will help move these trains from Southwest Virginia across Northern Virginia to Washington, D.C. So we have made a decision to partner with, uh, with Amtrak to get the, the two round-trip trains to Washington, D.C. and places north. However, there is a third commuter, there is a third option of a, a round trip we have between Roanoke and New River Valley, and we'll be working with um, the, the public, uh, such as Brightline or others, if they're interested, we'll put out a public procurement to see who will be running that, that daily commute, if you will, daily round trip between Roanoke and New River Valley. Okay, great. Uh, again, another question on operations. Is Corning amenable to this project and sharing the tracks? Uh, Kate and I have had some meetings with, have, they've been in a couple meetings with us, with Corning has, and uh, the, que the question says sharing the tracks. We will actually have some tracks that will um, uh, be connecting and kind of going off the Corning track, so they will not be impacted uh, very much at all by the 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 track will be laying. We'll have a pocket track dedicated to the station and a track dedicated to the Virginia line um, from north of the Corning tracks to the station. So there'll be minimal impacts to Corning and they, under they understood that in, in a call with us. All right. Uh, we have one more question operations and if that's the rest we'll we'll pivot to another theme uh, the question is may i also suggest utilizing island platforms for an easier flow of passenger traffic in both directions for increased capacity for passenger rail freight trains can be diverted onto a separate set of rails within the right-of-way which are placed further from the platform um understand that we understand the question uh 
In fact, in Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C., VPRA is helping to fund some island platforms, um, uh, Crystal City and Lanfont and other locations. So we're familiar with island platforms. It does give multiple edges. However, since there will be a maximum of six round trips in this area, and since none of them will, conf uh, will likely conflict with each other, we don't need, know if we need two edges, uh, meaning at, at the island platform. So it was a very good and, and knowledgeable question by the, uh, by the person who posed it. Um, but uh, we're looking at a side platform track, um, and it does reduce costs when you have a side platform versus a island platform. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, the next series of questions will be in regards to financials um, and probably just picking off what you just said. Uh, if Norfolk Southern continues to use the line, will they pay the state for the usage? Yes, there are uh, provisions in our agreement where they will pay for usage of the track, much like when VRE or Amtrak pay, rides on a host railroad, i.e. freight railroads, they pay for usage. So Norfolk Southern will pay for usage of the uh, Virginia line tracks. Okay. The next question asks, any financial numbers for the passenger station itself? Any financial numbers? I think we answered that on the slides. Those are high-level cost estimates, so we do have the, as part of our work, we did examine the cost. And Amanda, did you say financial numbers or passenger numbers? Someone had wrote financial numbers. Maybe they meant passenger numbers, um, that could have been a, a typo on, on the individual's end, but it does say any financial numbers for the passenger station, um, perhaps maybe construction they, cost. They are on slide, um, and, and this, these slides will be made. Um, they're on an earlier slide. Uh, oh. There's differing numbers for each of, the, each of the options. Yeah, it really ranges from about uh, the mid 50 million to uh, 170 plus. Million. And the mall options were in the 50 to 60 million dollar range, if I recall. Yeah. Okay. And that individual did just clarify they were curious what the, the station itself would cost, not the, I guess, the whole package with infrastructure and everything. We took the approach of the station site and the requirements that was, and we did not carve out the station building part of that. And one, one more uh, cost financial question, and then we'll pivot to another topic. Um, the question is, did your site cost estimates include the cost of transit route operation expansions that would be needed? The two mall sites are near existing routes, but the other two are not and are outside current transit service areas. So I guess we did not. Asking. I understand. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we did not consider cost of transit service Siting, um, and the infrastructure work that would be required to support uh, the transit services that would uh, come to and from the station. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Or um, sorry, sorry, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you both for that, and for Kelly for asking that question. All right. The next series of topic um, will be regarding the pedestrian bridge. And again, this is. One of them is related to financials. Um, Susan was asking, who pays for the pedestrian bridge? So that is something that we'll be working with the New River Valley Station Authority on to determine the, the proper um, participants who would be funding the pedestrian bridge. Um, and I'm anticipating another question coming about why we need a pedestrian bridge. Um, we believe it's very important that people should be able to access stations not just by cars, but by uh, other modes such as walking or biking. Um, and we know that there's the, the already development on the west side of the um, of the line near the mall, and um, there is more development to come. We've been told. And Michael, you were spot on. That was actually the next question. Um, I'll just read out loud. Why is the pedestrian bridge needed to the Villas neighborhood on the other side? And the last uh, pedestrian, brush, pedestrian bridge question is asking, what type of noise will the train produce when entering and leaving the station? More of a noise question, Amanda, but uh, yeah. a good one. <laughs> um, so in the, in the NEPA study that we're about to embark on after we conclude the feasibility study, we will examine noise and vibration um, together. They're, they're usually done together with some 
a technical approach and a technical analysis is produced to measure the, the anticipated amount of noise on the surrounding area and the impact of that and recommendations for any mitigations to surrounding um, sensitive receptors, such as residential units, uh, churches, places of worship, and um, restful areas. Um, so we'll, we will be doing a much more intensive technical study regarding that noise and vibration and other externalities and impacts that the station at the mall would uh, create. Thank you for that, Kate. Uh, all right, we're going to pivot to our next topic, which is um, community outreach um, regarding meetings and um, any future outreach coming forward. Um, the first one is asking, will the NEPA study and results be made public and be transparent? Will they have the opportunity for the public to ask questions? Could you repeat the first part of that question again? Sure. Will the NEPA study and results be made public and be transparent with the opportunity for the public to ask questions? Yes, that is the purpose of a NEPA study is exactly to be transparent and um, work with the public throughout the process to um, discuss uh, the progress of the NEPA analysis. So um, I have just completed um, one that took th two and a half years. Now, we don't expect that that will be the case on here, but we had at least three public meetings as part of that work. We expect to have an intensive communication and outreach program accompanying that that um, will uh, conclude with um, a public meeting uh, announcing the results of the, the final NEPA work and the mitigation. So um, based before that, we will have several meetings and be very involved with stakeholders in the community regarding how the progress of that design and um, complementary impact analysis and mitigations are developing. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the next question again is, is in regards to communications. Have you conducted or do you plan to engage the youth in the community in this process? Sure, we welcome any stakeholder that is interested in being as involved as they would like with the, pro with the project when we have milestones to discuss. Um, you know, we have met with many property owners uh, that we had direct impact for, the station areas and the concepts we showed you earlier. So everybody that you saw listed who had a station um, element listed on it um, got an email. Um, you can also participate, uh, not an email, got a certified mailing and then was offered a meeting, one-on-one um, -on -one meeting with the project team you see here. Um, there was also an extensive outreach effort gone with key stakeholders throughout the community, and we expect that um, these services will be offered throughout the NEPA project, the design, and the construction, so everyone's fully informed of what we're doing and where we're going. Uh, we have an email, email listserv that we've created, and you can you can um, we're happy to to send out the contact information if you'd like to sign up and have project updates that's available to you. And we have the project website with uh, contact us email um, that folks can access and, and try to request a meeting. Um, we're happy to go uh, meet with people either virtually or in, in, in person as it allows. All right, thank you, Kate, for that. Uh, we are going to shift to topics that relate to construction and impacts. Uh, the first question is many people use the Huckleberry Trail on an ongoing basis, both for recreation and utility. Will it be open and usable continuously? Yes, that's absolutely um, uh, a priority to um, any any transportation elements such as the Huck Huckleberry Trail or a road that we would impact during construction, we have to mitigate for that impact. So we would likely in the Huckleberry Trails case, relocate on a temporary basis the trail itself um, and while we do construction and have a, the permanent design um, installed so that it's access, accessible the way that folks um, uh, will we'll use it in the permanent solution, but you'll also be able to get to the same place um, in a temporary location. Does that mean that there will be a detour? Yes, um, there will likely be a detour in a temporary um, fashion uh, as part of the work. 
Do you have something to add? Yeah, Michael? just when we talk about relocation and detour, we're talking a few feet here and there. We're not talking okay. uh, anything more than that. A few feet here and there. So there is continual usage of the Huckleberry Trail. Now, having said that, um, we do want to be careful. There, 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 could there be a, a night or maybe a day where we need to tie in some some part of the of, of the trail, um, a, a new relo a new moving again, just a few feet over here and there. Um, but it's going to be very, very minimal. We're going to minimize it as much as possible. As I mentioned earlier, it's very important for us that people enjoy all modes of transportation, including walking and biking. And I think many of us here, I know those of us in the room, have, have gone on the Huckleberry Trail, gone on many times, and Kate actually went to the university in the area, um, knows it very well. We know how loved it is. Um, been out there different times of day and night. So that's a high priority for us to keep, keep that open as much as possible, and there will be minimal disruption for those who use the trail. And there'll be it'll be there'll be a communication um, element to any outages or um, detours or temporary uh, use of the trail or the road or any other element that we might impact for the transportation. So um, users, in all instances, would have notification pri prior notification regarding that outage or impact. All right. Thank you both. Uh, the next question, um, again, is relating to construction. Do you have any concerns with the grading and topography for the turnout coming from the Virginian line toward the NRV mall alternatives? That is something that we're looking at. Uh, we do understand, again, having walked it, having been in the area, that there is uh, some slight elevation changes from the Virginian line down to the mall. And also, Kate mentioned earlier, some elevation from the, the the parking location per se down to the to the station, but we believe in our feasibility study that they will uh, the elevation will meet the standards needed by uh, operators such as Amtrak, so we'll be able to to um, to serve. Now, however, if our furthering study shows that that is not possible, then we will have to look at other locations. But um, I think we are relatively confident that we. Um, should be able to uh, traverse the elevation differences and get to the mall sites if that, that, that those are indeed the ones chosen. All right, thank you. Uh, and it looks like two more questions are in regards to construction slash communication. Uh, the first one is, um, you know, this seems like a wonderful opportunity for the area. Um, the individual says they're, they're probably not alone having concerns about how the construction will impact our homes in the next several years. And they were asking, will there be meetings specifically for those who live in this area, um, you know, regarding the impact bubbles on the maps to be part of this conversation moving forward? Absolutely. We plan a robust community outreach program as part of this now that we've narrowed down this the feasible station locations, and that, that'll include a wider swath um, regarding the impacts um, as we move them forward through the NEPA work. Okay, and the follow-on question um, from a different individual was for regards to the, uh, they live in the community where the footbridge connects to, and they were just curious, has the HOA been made aware of this footbridge, or will they plan to be made aware in, in future meetings moving forward? So. Similar answer in that um, we were really looking to see what station areas were feasible through this study. So that was really the priority here, and to get the word out that this um, these this, this study existed, that the, described the elements that we were looking at and examining regarding the impacts. And then once we were in NEPA, we can really narrow down the communities we're impacting, the people we're impacting, the, the businesses and, and the like to be able to do some direct um, outreach to places like the HOA and, and surrounding businesses and um, users of the trail and insects and the like. All right. Uh, we are going to close that portion and we are going to pivot to our next topic, which is more in regards to planning. Um, it could be future planning or just follow on planning. Uh, the first question is, has there been any consideration of adding a storage track at the station site to accommodate privately owned passenger rail cars? Can you repeat the first part again? I'm sorry, Amanda. Sure, sure. Um, the first part says, uh, has there been any consideration of adding a storage track at the station site to accommodate privately owned passenger rail cars? So providing a storage track. 
We haven't examined that at this time. I, at this point, we were, again, just looking at the feasible station locations and how, to, how we could access the station itself. Okay. And the other planning question um, is in regards to, is there any future study work on extending the line further to the southwest following the I-81 corridor to Radford and possibly Bristol and even Knoxville in the future? Uh, what the study is doing is studying the, the feasibility of the station location in New River Valley. However, the location, the station location in New River Valley does not preclude um, a continuation of a corridor to Southwest Virginia. There are there are uh, ways to get from the locations we're looking at further southwest um, along Norfolk Southern routes. However, I should mention though we do not have. Um, that uh, authority from Norfolk Southern to extend um, further than the area we're looking at. So that would, if it was further to extend to Abingdon, Bristol, so on and so forth, it would, that would need the, the approval of Norfolk Southern and um, we do not yet have that. Okay, thank you both. Um, we are pivoting to a next, the other topic, which is in regards to service and routes. Uh, the first question asks, will there be a service area to prepare the train for the return trip? Say that one more time, Amanda. Sure. Will there be a service area to prepare the train for the return trip? Yes, there is. It's the, they will, um, once the train arrives at the station, they'll be on the pocket track and the service will be provided from that pocket track um, to and on the platform. So they'll be able to uh, service, clean out, um, do light um, maintenance and, and the like on that platform when, once it's in the, the train is in the pocket track. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, Amanda, next... one more thing. I only answered part of a question, part of a question earlier. Yes, there is a study, um, a very initial study of uh, passenger service to further Southwest Virginia by the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Um, so they, they have done a study on that, and uh, um, that is something that I believe is, should be available um, on their website. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for adding that. Uh, the next question, again, is regards to service and routes. Um, will there be a, I can never say this, I guess a Y or YAE to turn around the train, or will it be bidirectional with an engine on both sides? So with the timing of when we'll be putting the station in, uh, Amtrak is, is have Amtrak has a current procurement with Siemens to ha have push pull trains. Um, so there won't, won't be necessary to have a turnaround track. I should also mention another benefit of the new Amtrak trains um, means that when the, it's a, it's a dual mode train as well as being push pull. So when it gets to Washington Union Station, it won't have to wait extra long, sometimes often 45 minutes or so for the, to change the diesel, diesel engine to allow it to run an electric further north of that. So for those who are familiar with riding from Roanoke to say New York City, there's an extra long way to Union Station of about 45 minutes. So that will be reduced to about your usual 10 or 15 minutes that would be needed to stock the commissary, let people on and off. So there's a lot of benefits coming with the new Amtrak Siemens trains, one of which being push pull so that negates the need for a wide turnaround track. Thank you, Michael. Uh, one more question regarding service slash routes. Uh, the question, and it's a long one once, I'll kind of abbreviate it for the purpose of, of relaying the information. Um, the question is regarding, has there been any other passenger railroads that VPRA has considered? And they've listed several um, connection points in the South and, you know, we'll obviously be happy to take this as part of the public meeting summary. But so the question comes down to, is, has VPRA considered any other passenger rail routes um, for this project? And I, I can't pull up the question. I can, going based on my, I barely see what others have in their screen. Um, so, BPRA is um, has service that runs in Virginia uh, that supports Amtrak service from Roanoke to the points to the northeast, not, not just to Washington D.C., but the points northeast. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Amtrak is uh, a good operator to partner with because they do have access not only to Union Station, but access to points further northeast, such as Philly, um, uh, New York, and Boston, 
Um, and we have other routes, as people may know, in, in the Commonwealth from Hampton Roads and Richmond to points northeast and points south. Uh, but if the question is to about location and such as, so we do go to Norfolk, um, but uh, as far as service that is across, if someone's suggesting here um, across Virginia, that is something that the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, DRPT Department of Rail and Public Transportation is looking at called the Commonwealth Quarter and East to West Quarter. That would need significant upgrades in the Commonwealth as well, though. Um, and as far as to um, places such as Harrisburg and Greensburg, North Carolina, that would need uh, cooperation of states such as Pennsylvania and North Carolina to, to do so. There are, I believe, possibilities of connections to some of those locations um, while riding the, the, the service um, northward uh, there, or southward, there could be connections made by the other states, but that would have to be done in conjunction with the other states. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, looks like we've got a good sense of, of the comments and the questions that have come through regarding each of those topics. Um, so I'm just circling back to um, see what, what recent comments have come through since we started breaking out the comments in, in terms of themes. Um, so just a couple more. They're going to kind of, I guess, just be a little bit more sporadic. Um, the first one uh, is in regards to the elevation change to the track. And um, the, the comment is, I guess, in regards to isn't there a major elevation change in the tracks to then connect everything together, there will be a lot of rock breaking and digging to make this possible and how will this impact um, you know, construction moving forward? Um, so we recognize that, that there will be um, uh, digging, excavation that will be required by the design that we've um, examined and suggested that's feasible, feasible to move in forward, but we looked at that on a high level engineering um, look um, to determine what methods at a high level would be used to uh, excavate um, and make the track and the passenger rail um, uh, achievable. So we have a good sense of where we need to go with the next um, NEPA work and the engineering, um, but I couldn't tell you the details, and I'm also not an engineer, so you wouldn't want me to do that, but you would want Wayne Hyatt, who is on the team, to do that. Um, and he has looked at this at a very high level and, and, and has identified that it is feasible to excavate here. Thank you, Kate. Uh, looks like we have a couple more questions um, that are running out what's in the chat. Uh, the next question is in regards to the Huckleberry, Huckleberry Trails um, connection with the track. So the question is, as far as permanently, will the Huckleberry Trail go over the tracks when the station is complete? So I'm not sure which location um, we're referring to in this in this question, but in terms of um, over by the Virginia line, this, it is anticipated that it's likely that the Huckleberry Trail would be elevated, so it would cross above the tracks. Um, in terms of around the station location, maybe it, it, this person is asking about New River Valley Mall West site. Um, it'll likely go around and at the grade that it is today. I'm not sure that it would be elevated. That's quite a lot of ramping that we would have to do. So I'm, I'm quite sure it would be at the same um, grade level that it is now. Okay. But we'll have more details about that as part of the, the NEPA um, examination. And of course, those who have, have walked the Huckleberry Trail know it is elevated over the current Virginia line. So I think the question is, as the, as the line turns south, would it continue? But it also be elevated, so that's a that's a distinct possibility. Thank you both for that. Looks like we just have one more question for now, and that is in regards to noise. Uh, and the question is: Does a locomotive typically sound the whistle when entering and leaving the station? There are FRA quiet zone rules to be followed, um, and um, and we will and the trains will follow those FRA quiet zone rules. Um, they often have to do with uh, at grade crossings and things of that nature um, and uh, crossings that, that cross the tracks. So um, we don't foresee any here, but I don't want to speak uh, definitively in what the FRA rules are. I don't have them memorized, but I just work out, have worked out in the past. And again, it's generally about 
where there's grade crossings, where there's the whistle often blows when there's, uh, when I say grade crossings, highway crossings across the tracks, and we don't foresee any um, in the area from the mall north. Thank you, Michael, for that. And someone had just noted in the chat, uh, they believe the noise does um, sound whenever it crosses any passenger area. So um, that could just be, uh, you know, we'll obviously look into that and, and get clarification, as Michael said. All right, well, that is, uh, that's it for, for, I guess, what's coming through. People are starting to say thank you. All this is very exciting. Um, so if there's no other questions or comments, I will kick it back over to Kate and the team uh, to close us out for this evening. Amanda, I think I did see a question about parking that came in just the last couple minutes. Um, hmm. I don't uh, see that. Uh, for free, whether parking should be charging for parking. Um, it is typical for Amtrak lots to have a cost associated with it. And I think at a location such as such as at the mall, if there were to be a parking there, would probably want to be bifurcated from the rest of the mall so that Amtrak parking does not take up all the mall parking spaces. Um, and I think it's also important that we deter, uh, since it is a college area, uh, deter um, college students or others uh, from leaving cars for say a month at a time. Um, at a Christmas break or something like that, if there was uh, if parking was was charged, then probably um, people would probably be compelled to not leave the car there for so long. And as I mentioned earlier, we do want to find a fair balance between um, cars and pedestrian usage. And if there are, um, if it's free parking, that might encourage a lot of people to to drive. Whereas, as already mentioned, there are great transit options to to, to near to the mall currently or near the mall. And there's a lot of great pedestrian options too. So we'll, if there is parking, it'll be moderately priced, um, such as it is throughout the Commonwealth. There's, it's often, there is, is often a cost for parking throughout, at Amtrak stations throughout the Commonwealth. So that is our, that will be our plan to continue with that, with that procedure. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just had two more questions coming through. One of them um, was asking, will this be posted to the website, both the PowerPoint and the recording for the public to learn about? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will be posting those, I believe, either tomorrow afternoon or Wednesday. Um, so please stay tuned as we will get that, um, the video trimmed and, and posted for you. And uh, the last couple of final questions um, are in regards to, I guess, moving forward. Uh, are the two mall sites definitely the two sites we've narrowed the potential station locations to? And Again, what general advantages did they show? So the answer, the short answer is yes. And um, the feasibility study will further detail um, what the impacts uh, observed as part of that, those station sites are. Um, so stay tuned for the feasibility study uh, when it's released and we can walk yourself through those um, impacts created by each of the stations as we observe them and screen them, to move them forward. So um, was there any other questions, Amanda, that you wanted to address tonight? Uh, no, no. Just people saying excellent, well-organized meeting. Really appreciate the transparency and allowing the opportunity for, for us to even ask questions and comments regarding the Huckabilly Huckabell Trail help them feel um, a lot better about this. So everyone's saying thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for your time. And if you'd like to see a second show, um, feel free to join us tomorrow at noon. Uh, we'll be doing the same presentation over, hopefully less technology glitches, but there's never any promises there. Um, so thanks again, and we'll be in touch soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you all.